Does anyone remember some of the very first websites? I remember surfing the web with my dad back in the late 1990s and thinking, you know, this is pretty cool. And I heard that someday we might actually be able to buy anything we wanted to from our computers. And I thought, wow, you know, I'd, I just don't see that happening because I like going to the mall with my friends and trying on everything, you know, seeing all my options. And so when I heard that maybe we'd be able to buy things from our cell phones, I'm like, uh, I don't know if you've seen my cell phone from the 1990s, <laughs> but there's no way I'm going to try to scroll around on that teeny tiny little screen. Of course, go fast forward 20 years, and now it's hard to get my cell phone out of my hands. And not only has it replaced some of my trips to the mall, but also my cookbooks, my TV, and sometimes going to the movies. Um, and it's really kind of impressed upon me just how quickly uh, technology can change our lives, especially when it's entertaining, and it's convenient, and it's something that we can afford. I love this graphic from the New York Times because it just shows how quickly we are adopting newer technologies. So for example, it took about 100 years for the telephone to get into about uh, you know, all households across the United States, but it only took about 10 years for cell phones. And so we are adopting these technologies even faster than probably we realize. So now I get to study this, how these digital devices are uh, changing city form and development. And I'm excited to talk to you today about how it's really disrupting transportation and maybe it could even mean that you could get rid of your own personally owned car. Uh, that th these changes are really going to change our cities and the uh, urban environment. And then finally, this has some serious implications for how we live our lives, as well as how cities govern and provide government services. And I know the first thing that I almost always hear is that you're going to take my car keys out of my cold, dead hands. Um, and it's true, I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, but now if you go to just about any large city, you can start to experiment and try out some of these new mobility services. So if you go to downtown Portland, you can take a ride on a bike in Bikey Town on their, their bike share service, or this summer you'll get to take a scooter ride on Lime or Bird. And of course, just about most big towns across the country, you can take an Uber or Lyft ride. And so while you and I might always own our own vehicles, it's likely that my kids might not ever get their own uh, car or even get their driver's license. Instead, they might just purchase that part of the transportation system that they need at the time, whether it's a bike or a car or a bus, which they could always take, or who knows, maybe someday a rocket. And you don't have to just take my word for it. You can also follow the money. So many of the large uh, car manufacturers as well as technology companies are investing billions of dollars. Uh, General Motors and Ford uh, within the last year or so announced that they are going to invest between three and four billion dollars each. And even a lot of these companies are really um, diversifying the types of services that they are providing. So Uber uh, purchased Jump. And so from your Uber app, you could actually take a bike ride or a scooter ride, and even the big guys are getting into this. So Daimler, which uh, is better known for uh, making really large semi-trucks, um, has invested about $50 million into uh, uh, microtransit or shuttle services, a company called Via. All right, for just a minute, I'm going to switch gears here and just ask a show of hands, how many people purchased something online over the last holiday season? All right, <laughs> like, like most of us, um, I did as well. So uh, you are part of the revolution. Uh, it's not just how people are moving differently, but it's also how goods are moving differently. So for the last about four years, more people shopped online on Black Friday than actually walked in and purchased something in a brick and mortar store. And about 50% of these e-commerce sales um, are from Amazon. And so uh, not only, uh, are the, is the way that things are getting to us changing, um, but that we're also getting a lot of different kinds of deliveries. You can get your groceries delivered or uh, a restaurant meal delivered. And of course, you could always get a pizza delivered, but now just about any restaurant will deliver um, through Uber Eats or Grubhub, um, many of these different types of services. 
Uh, and once you put automation uh, into the scenario, a lot of the impacts that we're starting to see already from U UPS and FedEx coming into our neighborhoods um, really gets amplified and accelerated once you uh, have those autonomous vehicles. And so if you're like 50% of Americans, you say there is no way that uh, once we pry those car keys out of your hand that you're actually gonna get into an autonomous vehicle, you don't trust them. And without a doubt, people have died um, in some of the places where they're testing. And uh, so there's, there's additional research that needs to be done, uh, as well as some additional testing, but there's also some very good reasons if they can overcome those, ob overcome those obstacles uh, that you might want to consider it. And that's because about 40,000 people die every year on our roads, and another 2 million are seriously injured from car crashes. And the vast majority, uh, usually around uh, 85 to 95% of those crashes are due to human error. So uh, distraction, you're on your phone, or incapacitation, uh, people are drunk, or they fall asleep at the wheel. So of course, autonomous vehicles never get distracted by those things. So there's some real reasons we should be considering it. Uh, it's very likely that the cost of an autonomous vehicle to take a ride is gonna significantly uh, be reduced compared to owning your own car. Even today, um, there's been studies that have shown about one in four people in the United States would financially be better off if they just got rid of their car and used the services that are available. But often, one of the reasons we don't is because it's just not as convenient. So if these services become much less expensive and much more widely available, then it's highly likely more of us will use it. And that means the total number of trips that are taken is likely to increase, and then the total number of vehicle miles on the road is also expected to dramatically increase. And part of that is because these cars, um, and even the Ubers and Lyfts today, they go and they drive empty and they come and pick me up and then they drop me off at work and then they go empty somewhere else and pick other people up. And so all of these uh, empty vehicles or zombie cars uh, are gonna end up clogging our roads. And that's maybe something not to laugh at. <laughs> all right. And, I'm guessing, like me, most of you have one of these. You've got a car, and what's that car doing right now? It's parked, like it is about 95% of the time. We have about one to two billion parking spots in the United States. There's a saying that form follows function, and really, form follows parking. There's probably nothing else that impacts our cities the way that parking does. And if you're a developer, you know one of the first things you need to do before you want to build something is figure out how much minimum parking is required. And then with the space you've got left over, what kind of a building could you actually put there? Um, and so if we are no longer driving our own cars to our destination, then this really provides a really great opportunity to remake our cities. Of course, we're also, though, transferring, you know, parking lots are really good at dispersing people when they're trying to get somewhere. And so uh, if you have been to an airport recently or dropped off a kid in an elementary school, you know what it's like when everybody wants to be at the same place at the same time. And so cities are really starting to think about, uh, you know, how they need to manage the curb. Uh, so just imagine if you're uh, uh, sending an autonomous vehicle to pick up your kid and now that kid doesn't know what color your car is. Uh, <laughs> when I talk to transportation uh, professionals uh, or, or other types of consultants, uh, they are recommending to their clients that they don't build any parking that they don't need to, that we might actually be at peak parking and that they should be thinking about those service parking lots as you know, really temporary. And, and what are they gonna do with that when there's no longer anyone parking on that? Or even if there's a parking garage, uh, could they think about using that space at some point in the future for housing or for office space? And that ultimately, we might only need about 10 to 15% of the uh, parking that we have today for uh, the future autonomous vehicle fleet. And so if you're in a city like downtown Portland, then there's not really all that many redevelopment opportunities. And honestly, most of them have some of my favorite food carts and they're already slated for development. 
But once you start to move out into the suburbs or into smaller towns, then the picture looks a lot different. So if you're in Gresham, then suddenly you can start to see all of that parking space, and cities are really going to have to be strategic and think about how they're going to be filling in that space and what they're going to do with it. This is something that planners have done for a while, and I'm a planner, and I'm, I'm kind of excited about thinking of, about planning for people and not for cars. And so one of the really great examples is in New York City, where they actually shut down a street and uh, built a plaza. So in New York Times, it's one of the, the most popular places for tourists to go, and it's really wonderful. But I grew up in a small town, and many of the people that I grew up with would say, well, we don't live in New York. You know, we're not going to do something quite like that. But actually, small towns are thinking about how they can build uh, a place where people want to go and they want to get out of their cars and visit with their friends and family. How do we build community? And so even in small towns like McMinnville, people are thinking about this also as an economic development opportunity. It just makes sense. And not only that, but it also makes sense for our health. And studies show that if you build uh, uh, schools and shops and other kinds of jobs within about a mile of where people live, then about a third to a half of them are much more likely to get out of their cars and actually want to walk, which is really good for our health. Of course, I've talked a lot about you know, the opportunities that this technology brings to redevelop our cities, but there's also this other side that if you reduce the friction of transportation and you make it cheaper and easier, and now you don't have to worry about driving, you, can, uh, you could actually work in your vehicle, or you could binge watch Game of Thrones, uh, <laughs> then people might actually even live farther away. It, potentially puts a lot of pressure on sprawl, especially if what you want to do is live in the woods or you're just looking for less expensive housing or just a slightly bigger yard. And the more that we spread out, the bigger the implications are for how we pay for all this public services that we all depend on. Everything for how we pay for our roads and how we make sure that they're maintained and don't have potholes. Um, really environmental impacts, uh, such as climate change or habitat loss. If we're spread even farther out, it makes it more difficult for emergency services like fire and police to respond uh, quickly, as well as all of this has implications for our property values and the property taxes that pay for all of these governmental services. So I hope I've impressed upon you that AVs are not a transportation issue and e-commerce is not a retail issue. These are everything issues and they're gonna touch every part of our lives. And now is the time to be planning for this change because when it comes, it's gonna come really quickly and cities that think ahead are gonna stay ahead. Thank you.